Um, so let's just pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's powerful. It's like a hammer sometimes. And Lord, I just pray that as we turn to your word this morning, as we share, as we look at an aspect of your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister that you'll take my words and that you'll make them effective in the hearts and of those we're hearing today. We want to see no one but Jesus only. We pray that he shall be glorified as a result of what I have to say today. People's lives shall be impacted from, through the word of God. We ask it in your name and for your glory. Amen. Today I want to speak to you about the greatest encounter anybody can ever have. And if you're a Christian today, then you'll have had this encounter. If you're not a Christian, you need it desperately. Because it's the only encounter that will save you, that will get you into heaven, that will give you eternal life, and that will give you peace, joy, and full satisfaction. And I would think that by now, most of you will understand what encounter I'm talking about. I'm talking about salvation or conversion. You know, since I put my trust in Jesus Christ many, many years ago, I've had a number of God encounters in my life. Interestingly, however, um, I would have to say that all of them were not planned. Not one of them was planned. They came out of the blue as God impacted my life, got my attention, changed me, spoke to me, revealed himself to me, did something for me, showed me areas of my life where I needed to change. Someone took place in a church service like this, and it can happen again this morning in this church service. Some took place as I fellowshiped and prayed and sought God in, in my private room, you could say, or as I read God's word. And, and some took place when I was on mission trips in other countries. There were times where God impacted my life. But the only encounter this morning that really matters, that really counts, which is more important than any other encou encounter we could ever have, is God saving us, God coming into our lives through conversion and through salvation. You know, Christianity is supremely a religion of conversion. Everything we say, Everything we believe is built upon one fundamental revolutionary premise. Listen to me. We don't have to stay the way we are. Our lives can be radically changed by God. And genuine conversion, salvation is a miracle that happens in a moment when God enters our life. When God impacts our life. When the, and the picture of our lives will never be the same again when he comes in. Religion is one thing. Salvation is something entirely different. It is the conviction that long-held prejudices can be overcome. Lifetime habits can be broken. Deeply ingrained patterns of sin can be erased in a moment. And to suggest or imply otherwise is to limit the powerful message and the power of the gospel. I believe with all my heart today that if you're not saved or you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, God can radically change your life, transform your life in a moment as you respond to the gospel. This is what Paul said, who had an impact in his life. We're going to talk about him. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, some of the old has gone, or some of the new has come. He said, it's all gone, and the new has come. God says, all the old, old has gone, and the new has come. And so salvation is a brand new start. It's being born again. It's a new creation experience, which means everything we did in the past has been forgiven and gone. And the Bible talks about, illustrates it being buried in the deepest sea. You know, the problem we have, we try and drag it back up again. If it's gone, it's gone, leave it there. Don't become a, a diver. 
But more importantly, listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said himself in John 8, 36. He says, he says so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. <laughs> Friends, you see, I'm passionate about this. Because, because we've got to be very, very careful that we don't limit the power of the gospel. Because... When Jesus does a work in our life, it's a complete work. That doesn't mean to say that we've still got things we've got to dealt, deal with within our lives. But as far as our sinful condition is concerned, and the things that are burdening us, God can remove them. God can deal with them. And if there's somebody here today who's never put their trust in Jesus Christ, I want to say on the authority of God's word, you can be changed. You can be different. You can be totally and miraculously changed and transformed. You can move in an entirely new direction. God can do for you what you can't do for yourself. Now, if we take the, that, tr the, that truth away from Christianity, it becomes simply a set of rules. Because if we, if we take that away, it ceases to be supernatural. We often say, can a leopard change his spots? In himself and by himself, he can't. But with God, all things are possible. And today I want to look at one man's encounter, possibly one of the most incredible salvation encounters in the history of Christianity. Possibly the greatest conversion story in the Bible that resulted in a terrorist becoming an evangelist, becoming an apostle. It's the conversion of the very man who, who quoted earlier, if any man is in Christ, is the new creation. He, 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 he could say this because he experienced it. It's the conversion of the man called Saul of Tarsus. Raised a Jew, trained a rabbi, who became a violent persecutor of the early Christian church. He hated Christ and his followers so much that he, he did all he could to eradicate this new religion as, it, as, as though it was a dreaded virus. He was to the Christian faith a terrorist who did great evil in the name of God, the God of the Bible. One day he met Jesus. His life was permanently transformed. The old went. The new came. He was born again became a new creation. So bad was this man's reputation that at first almost nobody believed that his conversion was real. So when he started fellowshipping among Christians, they couldn't believe that this man was really changed because they knew him for what he was and they were suspicious and they actually thought that maybe this was a way of, of, of sort of getting into the Christian uh, faith and dragging those who were Christians into prison. Word quickly spread that Saul, the persecutor, had come to Christ. And over time, he proved to be genuine in his faith. What happened to him made such an impact that the New Testament, New Testament contains three separate accounts of his conversion. First one is in Acts 9. The second one is Acts 26. And the third one, which is our text, is Galatians 1, verse 11 to 24. And if you've got your Bible... And you should have. It's your workbook. You're in school. I get really annoyed personally with people who can't bring the Bible to church. It must be, must be the first thing you bring to the house of God. And actually, I don't like these. Sorry, Nate. I don't like them either. I like a real one. <laughs> Not the, those on the iPhone. <laughs> No, that's better than nothing, Nathan. Don't misunderstand me. Well, I just, I just like, I like to see something. I'm not, it's up to you if you want to take, I personally, I personally, I personally, my eyes are getting bad as well. I personally like something I can read. So if you've got your Bible, turn with you to the passage. Galatians 1, verse 11 to 23. We'll work our way through it. Paul's story begins with a statement. 
about the source of his gospel preaching. Look at verse, what he says in verse 11 to 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that was man-made or man-made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And these verses emphasize two important points. The first one is this. First, the gospel is not Paul's idea. It was God's idea. And the second thing is, because the gospel comes from God, it must be true. Paul is highlighting the truth that the gospel he preached to the Galatians was not of his own making. It came from God, and when he preached the gospel to them, he was merely the conduit of the truth. He was the channel. He was the instrument through which the gospel was communicated. Christianity, see, does not spring from legends or vague dreams. It is not the result of clever argument arrived by some ancient church council. The gospel message is truly good news because it is God's good news. With that established, with that as the foundation, Paul now proceeds to tell his own story of conversion. And he has a three-point outline. Three points. Actually, his outline is always good as far as giving your testimony is concerned. The first thing he says, first point, he talks about his life before conversion. And whenever you're sharing your uh, testimony with somebody, sometimes it's good to tell them what you were like before you found Christ. Secondly, he says, how he came to Christ. He talks about his salvation experience, how he came to Christ, and that's always good again. Going on from where, telling them about what you were like before, then you tell them how you found Christ. And his third point was his life after coming to Christ. How his life had changed. That's a great testimony. You're speaking to somebody, tell them about what you were like before you found Christ. Tell them how you, how you found Christ, and then tell them how your life has changed. And so I say, if you can't get to number three, you've got a big problem. Because something happens when you find Jesus. Your life changes. Things become different. So let's go through. Let's, let's look, first of all, Paul's life before conversion. Verse 13 to 14. For you heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. This verse tells a chilling story. Before Paul came to Christ, he was perfectly happy in his career as a rising Jewish leader and an avid Christian hater. His driving motivation was to destroy the new religion called Christianity. Listen to me, he felt no remorse over his persecution of the followers of Christ. In fact, he regarded it as service for God. He had no desire to come to Christ. In fact, he felt no need at all in his heart for Jesus. His religion satisfied him in every way and he saw no need of anything else. Paul had no interest or desire in becoming a Christian. He wasn't looking for Christ. He was opposed, he was against, he was angry about everything and everyone associated with Jesus Christ. Only God could save a man like Paul. And that's exactly what God did. If you were to look at Acts 8 verse 1 to 3, you'd, you'd see there that before his conversion, Saul went from house to house looking for Christian followers to imprison them. It says this, and Saul began to destroy the church of God, going from house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. His heart was full of murderous rage against anyone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. In Acts 9, 1 to 2, he tells us that Saul went on the road to Damascus and he was breathing out, the Bible says, murderous threats against the, the Lord's disciples. He was even given letters, permission to go into the synagogue so he could, if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might 
take them and put them in prison in Jerusalem. And that word breathing there is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's a very dramatic and descriptive word. It, it was commonly used to describe battle stallions snorting breath from their nostrils as they prepared to charge. And that was a type, he was like, it was like, that was, Paul had a hatred for the church of God. One man who has got a book called Word Pictures, the New Testament puts it like this, threatening and slaughtered come to, to be the very life breath that saw breathe like a war horse that sniffed the smell of battle. He approved of the stoning of Stephen. He watched him die. And when other Christians were put to death, he, was, he would cast his vote in agreement. In his mind, the best way to defeat Christianity was to imprison, persecute, and in many cases, kill all the Christians. In his zeal, he had no peer. He was above everybody. He stood out as the fiercest opponent of the church of God. He was an anti-Christian religious fanatic. He was a bigot, a zealot, and a man whilst, uh, whilst, whilst given over to the hatred of Christians. He would stop at nothing to prevent this new movement from spreading. Now Paul tells this story of his past because he wants us to understand that he wasn't what we might call a seeker. He wasn't seeking anything except more Christians heads. He had no sense of no, uh, his need of salvation. No inner voice calling him to come. It would be hard to imagine a more hopeless case. Why bother praying for a man like that? He'll never be saved. He was totally convinced he was right. He was totally convinced Christians were wrong. He hated Christianity. He loved Judaism. He was lost and didn't know it. He enjoyed his life. He enjoyed making Christians fearful. And he wasn't looking, looking for something better. We, we can sum it up by saying he was on a collision course with eternal judgment. What he desperately needed, but wouldn't admit, was a strong dose of divine intervention. Why does Paul paint this picture so black about himself? Well, one, because it was true, and secondly, so that the brilliant light of the gospel can be clearly seen. See, not everyone has a story like Paul's. I mean, have you got a story like Paul's? Did you go around killing Christians? But actually, many do have a similar story. In the church of Jesus Christ around the world, and even in our country, you'll find men and women who, who were gone in sin but, but before they came to Christ. There are those who spent time in prison who found Christ. Young people who've been controlled by drugs and drink, and people who've been in and out of jail who are now Christians. There are former thieves, adulterers, those who've been involved in all sorts of immorality. If we wanted to play name the sin, we would all find throughout the church of Jesus Christ that, that there's winners. See, God changed them. They encountered God. They encountered God's powerful gospel and everything changed. And this is the gospel we preach. And this is what we should experience. This is what we can experience. Paul's story tells us uh, all, all the, the many similar stories throughout the church of Jesus Christ tells us the gospel is powerful. God can turn life around. That nobody is beyond the ability of an all-powerful God. He can save and he can transform anyone. The old can go and the new can come. No one is outside of God's grace. Paul writing in Romans 1 verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So never stop praying 
for those who think are beyond salvation. Because in a moment, out of the blue, God can break into their lives, just like he did in the life of Paul. Never, 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 never stop praying. And secondly, notice Paul's conversion in verse 15 to 16. In verse 15 and the first part of verse 16, we read this. But when God, who set me apart from birth, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. Gentiles. You know, when thinking about God and his gospel, that word but is an incredible word. It changes everything. But. But when God. Praise the Lord for God's buts. When writing to the Ephesians, he again, Paul again says, says the same thing. He describes in Ephesians 2 how, how in his pre-conversion state, and he talks about the pre-conversion state of the Ephesians, that they followed the ways of the world, gratifying the cravings of their sinful nature, falling out their own desires. And then he says in verse 5, But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were spiritually dead in our transgression. It is by grace you be inside this but is the great interruption God interrupts Paul's life with a but all that happened to Paul came because of that little word he was a sinner but God he hated Jews but God Paul wanted to destroy the church of God, but God. Paul was enjoying his life, but God. Paul wasn't looking for a new life, but God. Paul intended to kill more Christians, but God. Notice the change of focus. When Paul talks about his former life, it's always I, 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 I. I did this. I was doing that. Totally absorbed. In himself. But when he talks about his conversion, the focus shifts. And notice it is God who is now the focus. He is the one who is active. He is the one who is predominant in his life. So when God came into Paul's life, he came in without permission. Listen to me. Without permission. Paul never asked him to come in. Interesting, that, isn't it? He didn't want to be asked. And while Saul was on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus barged right in. That's marvelous. That's, I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. He didn't ask permission. Because if he'd asked, Saul had said no. He came in where he wasn't wanted or expected and took over his life. Notice what he says, God was pleased to reveal his, his son in me. He came in because, the Lord came in because he wanted to. He chose to come in. He entered without ringing the doorbell, without knocking the door. There's, that is pure, sovereign, saving grace. If God had wanted, waited for an invitation, Paul would never have been saved. He was lost and spiritually dead. But Jesus came along and raised him to life without his permission. And what we learn from this is that salvation belongs to the Lord. It begins with God, it continues with God, and it ends with God. Salvation is of the Lord. Notice another remarkable statement in these verses. Paul said that God called him from his mother's womb. God set me apart from birth, he says. This means that God was tracking him down from the very beginning of his life. Think about that. You know something? I believe that that's the case for many of us. When we look back, we see how God was tracking us down, using circumstances, slowly and, sh and surely bringing us to a place where we we'll respond. God had his eye on Paul while he was still in the womb. Listen to me. God had his eye on Paul when that human being was still in the womb. While he was a toddler, 
God was watching every step. During his teenage years, God kept him in sight. During the long years of rabbinical training, God was calling him. Paul didn't know it, he didn't feel it, he was totally unaware of it. In fact, he couldn't see it at all until he actually came to Christ, then he could see it. But after he came to Christ, then he could look back and see God's fingerprints all over his life, in every part of his life. And when he, the time finally came, God reached down, slapped him down on the Damascus Road and brought him into the kingdom. His whole life had been planned by God and, and f uh, for just, just that moment. Nothing had happened by accident. All was ordained as part of God's divine plan. So I just, I, I revel in that truth. And that blows me. That blows my mind. Because that's what God's done for me. That's what God's done for you if you're a Christian today. <coughs> and after God has sovereignly brought him to his knees, when he encountered God, he responds. Paul brought, God brought pow Paul powerfully to a place where he had no other choice but to come and to accept Jesus. And as Paul said himself, this was bound to happen because he was set apart from birth. See, when God calls a man like this, he responds, he comes, he obeys. God will have it no other way. God overcomes our reluctance, knock down, knocks down all our excuses, slowly but surely, truly draws us to Christ. We often aren't aware of it. We, are, we often say, don't we, I found the Lord. I want, you to, I want to remind you of something this morning. If the Lord didn't find us first, we would never have found him. And in the end, that's the way by which God gets all the glory. The glory for our salvation. We come thirdly to Paul's life after conversion. In verse 16 to verse 24, this is what it says, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. Later I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They, they only heard the report, this man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Now that might seem a mouthful. But Paul emphasizes in these verses about what he didn't do. He didn't immediately go to Jerusalem to be trained by the apostles. He didn't start an evangelistic ministry right away. So what did he do? He dropped out of sight for three years. It was three years later when he really stepped out into his ministry. I tell you what we'd have done if somebody like that was converted in our church or in the church of Jesus Christ. This is the sort of things we'd do. We'd have him on Christian radio and Christian TV. That's what we'd do. We'd give him to give his testimony at all the big Christians, Christian events around the country, possibly around the world. We gave him to write a book, hit the Christian talk show circuit, but that wasn't God's plan. He spent three years in Arabia, evidently in personal study and meditation. Now, I went to college for two years. He was there for three years on his own. God working on his life, preparing him for ministry. He went to Damascus. He made a brief trip to Jerusalem to meet people. You know, we've got to be very careful when somebody comes to, comes to Christ that we don't push them. Right. Step by step by step by step. He went north to Syria and Cilicia to preach the gospel. 
In all of this we see new attitudes emerging in his life. Now he has a new desire, an attitude towards the believers. A new attitude beyond, uh, toward the truth. A new attitude toward the gospel. He now preaches what he once tried to destroy. He wants to be with Christians now. He wants to fellowship with them. He wants to receive the word of God. He wants to grow in his Christian faith. Once he hated believers, now he seeks their fellowship. Once he hated the truth, now he lives by the truth. Once he hated the gospel, now he preaches the gospel. Once he was called Saul, now he's called Paul. Same man, new man, everything is different now. Once he was a terrorist, now he's an evangelist. Christ made all the difference. This passage ends on a wonderful note. As Paul says that the churches in Judea, which he once terrorized in his pre-conversion days, recognized the amazing change in his life. And they glorified God because of him. Uh, his life pointed people towards God, towards Christ. And this leads me to a simple and profound question. Is anyone glorifying God because of your life? That's a, that's a real challenge, folks. Is anyone glorifying God because of my life? Because of the way that I live? Because of the things that I say? Are people being drawn to the glory of God? Is our life pointing people to God? I want to close these thoughts with, very quickly, four truths to take home with you. So as I wrap up, wrap up this message, here are four key truths to take home with you and to start focusing upon. The first one is this. The Christian gospel comes from God, not from man. Yeah. I know I said it, but we need to say it again. The Christian gospel comes from God, not from man. And that is a hugely important point because we live in a society that teaches us over and over again that all the religions are basically the same. We're all going to the same place. And that no religious system can be thought to be superior to, than any other system. And that is nonsense. But many people accept it as truth. We sometimes speak to people in the food bank. And their view is that well, we're all going to go to the same place in the end. I really appreciate your help you're giving us. And, the, you know, and yeah, I'll take him a, a prayer. But we're all going to the same place in the end. Let me remind ourselves of what he said. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that was man-made. It, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And this is the only way a person can receive it, by revelation from Jesus Christ, as the Holy Spirit convicts them and convinces them and draws them to the truth. The gospel is placed based on a sober historical fact surrounding the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's true because it comes directly from God. Second point. Conversion is a pure miracle that depends on God alone. God takes responsibility for a person's salvation. He arranges the circumstances so that we can know him personally. We rarely see that in advance, but looking back we can see clearly how the hand of God was graciously drawing us to himself conversion is not a co corporate venture between God and man thus all the glory belongs to the Lord third point the worst sinners often make the best saints the worst sinners often make the best saints if Paul's conversion teaches us anything it teaches us that some of the best saints have been the worst sinners Paul was basically a modern day antichrist terrorist, hell bent in causing as much physical habit on the Christian faith that he could, but because of the encounter he had with God, the terrorist became an evangelist, an apostle, a teacher of God's word. 
In fact, nearly all the epistles in the, in the New Testament are penned by the, this man. It's as though as God delights in taking the most brutish sinners and deeply and profoundly converting them. And such men and women bear the scars of their past life and, and bring their baggage with them into the God's family. But when God, God's work is done on them, those same saints of God are a powerful testimony to a skeptical world. Now, I came across this statement this week which really blessed me. Might not seem profound to you, but bless me. It's, it's, and this is it. God does not recruit heroes. I think that's a fantastic phrase. God does not recruit heroes. It's so true, friends. Many are, in the eyes of the population may be considered great. But in the eyes of God, they're just ordinary folk. We're all ordinary folk. I tell you, Bonky's an ordinary guy. Billy Graham's an ordinary guy. They're all ordinary folk that God has touched and changed. And guess, we're all ordinary folk. God doesn't have favourites. You're just as important in the eyes of God as I am. Every one of you here today, just as important to God as I am. Why we recognise God takes people, gives them gifts and abilities and talents to do certain things. They're still no different to us. Still ordinary people in the eyes of God. All equal in his sight. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I'm, I want to be part of anything where, where God's got favourites. He doesn't have any favourites. The Lord delights in taking ordinary folk like you and me and doing extraordinary things to, through them. And that's what God, what, what God wants to do for each one of us here today. You as an ordinary people, person, he wants to take you and do extraordinary things through you. No matter what you think about yourself, whatever your estimation of yourself, God wants to take your ordinary life and do extraordinary things through you. And he will if you'll allow him to. When God by the Holy Spirit draws a person to Christ, he saves them, justifies them, converts them, cleans them up, fixes them up, dresses them up, and then sends them out to do battle in the service of the King of Kings. Final point, to take home with you. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. What a, what a marvelous truth. No one is beyond the, the power of the grace of God, the reach of God's grace. We don't deserve it. We'll never be able to deserve it. But the grace of God has touched us. The grace of God has impacted our life. The grace of God changes everything. Surely this is the reason why Paul's story shows up three times in the New Testament. If God can save a man like Paul, he can save anyone. Do you hear me? Anyone. You included if you don't know him today. If you're here today thinking that he'll never be able to change my life, I'm here to tell you on the authority of God's word he can. In fact, he can change anybody's life, including yours. And he can and will do it if you'll simply, by faith, call upon him. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. And what this should also do, it ought to encourage every single one of us to keep praying for our friends and family. You know, often our prayers, they seem to bounce off the ceiling, don't they? We pray for months and for years and there's no apparent result. But don't despair, friend, this morning. We often see, what we often see is not the whole story. No one would have predicted Paul's conversion. Listen to me now. Ten minutes before it happened, it seemed impossible. Five minutes before it happened... No one would have, have, have any reason to expect anything. Ten seconds before the light broke into his life and God spoke, Paul's heart was as hard as ever. But in a moment, God broke in. Keep on praying. Keep on witnessing. 
Keep on believing. You never know what God will do. And as we think about those who are far from God, we can take this comfort. The farther they are from God today, the greater the celebration. When all those prodigal sons and daughters finally come home to the Father's house. In two weeks' time, it will be Mother's Day. So I, I, I've, told, I've said it now, so you've got no excuse, okay? And in the light of this, and to emphasize the importance of keeping on praying, I want to say something to the ladies, and particularly the mothers and grandmothers amongst us. It's very simple but powerful. Don't stop praying. I believe one of the most powerful forces in the world is the prayers of godly women. When God stirs up a mother to start praying, you'd better, you'd better back off. Because something's going to happen. There are mothers who prayed their prodigal children, prodigal children into the kingdom of God one by one. Many godly grandmothers have prayed and wept whole generations of children and grandchildren back to the Lord. The same is true of sisters and single women. God will not waste the tears and prayers of righteous women. In 1820, a man called George Baker, who was a Baptist minister in Dorset, became increasingly distressed because his teenage, of his teenage son's decision to have nothing to do with God or Christianity or the church. Both he and his wife prayed much for their son that, they might, that he might turn to Christ. And during this time, the minister's wife became very ill, suffering much, and eventually she died. Sometime later, his son's life took a, took a dramatic change. He came to Christ, came to faith, he was converted. And when his father asked him, he said, which sermon, which sermon was it that led you to, to this decision? That's, that's a preacher. Which sermon? When you were sat in that church and I was preaching, which sermon did it? He replied, It was the silent ones she prayed as she was slowly passing away. She never saw him come to Christ. But even during those terrible, that terrible Ill illness, she continued to pray. I've told this one before. Similar stories told of George Muller who once wrote, the great, the great point is never to give up praying until the answer comes. I've been praying for 63 years and eight months for a friend's conversion. He's not saved yet, but he will be. How can it be otherwise, I'm praying? The day came when his friend found Christ. It happened the very moment Muller's casket was being lowered into the grave. And around that grave, this man that Muller had been praying for Received Jesus Christ. Never saw it. Never saw it in his eyes. He saw it by faith. Never saw it physically. But he kept praying. Persistent prayer won the battle. And this is why we should never give up praying. We pray because Jesus is still in the life changing business. He still saves. He still converts, he still rescues men and women who are far gone in their sin. There is no case too hopeless for the great physician. The words of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 are still true. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Let's pray, shall we?